Welcome to the European Central Bank podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Michael Steen, and in today's episode, we will cover the impact of coronavirus on the economy. Now, I say the economy, as that's our focus at the ECB, but it's worth taking a moment to reflect that this is a gruesome disease with a spiralling death toll. Each one of those numbers that updates daily represents a tragedy for the families and friends of those who died. To try to keep everyone safe, many of us have been urged to stay at home. That's had some fairly stark effects on the economy. People are buying less, companies are producing less, whole sectors have just come to a stop. People have lost jobs, or have greater uncertainty about their jobs. In this episode, we're trying to understand the economic impact of the coronavirus pandemic and the ECB's response to it. We're joined by ECB Executive Board Member and Chief Economist, Philip Lane. Philip, thanks a lot for being with us. Good morning. Um, Now, this is a bit of a peculiar setup, of course. I'm at my desk at home just outside Frankfurt, and you're in Dublin, I believe. Um, Where are you and and how are you doing? So for the last few weeks, I've been uh, working from home. As you know, the uh, executive board has been working on a split team basis. So in these weeks, I've uh, worked from home. Uh, So far, uh, that has turned out okay. I think the ECB is built on a, a lot of teamwork. And I suppose my observation is if that teamwork has already been in place, so now it's nearly a year since I joined the ECB. So if you know the people uh, very well, then the fact that the day-to-day meetings are over the the internet, over the phone line is okay because you already know, if you like, uh, the, the people you're talking with we can work quite effectively, at least for a while from home. That's the philosophy behind uh, how the board is working. Well, um, to start off with, let's maybe talk a bit about the economy as a whole and how the coronavirus pandemic has affected it. What what are your observations? Where we are now, uh, here we are mid-May, it's probably at the very bottom of uh, the the economic impact of, of the virus. That, you know, of course, China in the first few weeks of 2020 uh, ha- had a big hit. We've seen China now starting to recover a little bit. But for the European economy, uh, you know, in some countries is early March. For more countries is mid-March when, when the severe restrictions came into play. And only now uh, in the middle of May is there some uh, relaxation. So in, in these weeks where a lot of, uh, if you like, uh, face-to-face economic activity has been restricted, uh, this has been a really uh, spectacular decline in economic activity. Uh, it's very hard to look backwards and find uh, previous examples because, you know, uh, sometimes people say, oh, this is like the Great Depression. It's not in the sense of the week-by-week decline in economic activity is more rapid this time. But on the other hand, we do know as uh, the restrictions are lifted, not going back to the old normal, but some level of recovery in economic activity can be expected. Uh, but if you like, every everyone who's looking at, at the European economy, the world economy, is agreeing that right now, at the second quarter of 2020, will be the bottom. And then in the coming weeks and months, We will have some recovery, but the big open question is how quickly would that recovery happen Uh, over what time period? Because, you know, I think we can all agree that what we expect now is uh, social distancing and also the personal attitudes to economic activity are going to remain uh, subdued until a vaccine is found. So it's not just a case of lifting the severe restrictions. It's also a case of uh, working out how to adapt how we do business, how we consume, how we invest uh, over the coming months. Okay, and that's a bit this concept of the new normal, right? So when we, we go back, but it's it's not like what it was before exactly, at least for the time being. Right, I think there's two sides that on the supply side, it does make it more difficult to conduct normal economic life. So, uh, you know, every day you can read about how offices have to be reconfigured, how uh, shopping has to be reconfigured. And then when you think about global supply chains, even just the the coordination issue, which is, you know, around the world, uh, a given city might be ready, 
uh, but it's reliant on uh, inputs from somewhere else in the world. And then on the uh, you know demand side, uh, the question is when will uh, people feel comfortable, for example, taking a vacation? When will people feel comfortable uh, going to a restaurant? Uh, so there's, there's many open questions there. And then on investment, you know, it's not exactly the conditions under which uh, firms will want to commit to large scale uh, projects, given all of the uncertainty. OK, we've clearly had a lot of bad news recently. Hospitals and healthcare workers have been struggling in some countries to deal with the crisis. So-called key workers in public transportation or the food industry have carried on working. Now, you, you mentioned this very dramatic decline we've seen um, caused by uh, essentially a sudden stop for big parts of the economy. So which sectors in the euro area have been or will be hit the most, would you say? Well, I think the key characteristic is really the, the face-to-face element. Uh, because, of course, uh, as we all have discovered, uh, you can do a certain amount of uh, economic activity remotely uh, through, through the internet, whether that's, as we just talked about, organisations, uh, uh, producing services in particular remotely. But of course, you can also do uh, to a degree online shopping, uh, but that doesn't really work for uh, uh, tourism, which is a very big uh, sector. It doesn't work for transportation. So whether that's personal uh, travel, uh, business travel, uh, it doesn't work for that. It doesn't work for hotels. So that, so, so that whole sector of trade, transport, uh, food services has been hit. Entertainment, you know, that's a big part of in a high income society. An important part of economic activity is arts, entertainment, re- recreation, sports and so on. That's been hit a lot. For a while, construction uh, halted in a lot of places, even though that's one of the first sectors to recover. Manufacturing, as we mentioned, uh, if you're in an industry where essentially either uh, you're waiting for vital uh, inputs to arrive, uh, you may not be able to produce. But of course, also uh, when you're producing uh, highly valuable goods, where there's a limit to how much you can uh, stock them up um, for sale later on. Uh, then the fact that it's just impossible, for example, nearly impossible to, to sell cars, for example, in this environment, then then the car factories have to have to pause to, to, to a good degree. So, you know, there's a lot going on. OK, so if we turn to, to the policy response, I mean, we, we've seen a lot of measures already taken, um, governments introducing guarantees and that kind of um, thing, um, fiscal responses. Uh, we've had responses at the European level and also at the national level. Um, but if we look at the ECB, what is what is our role in this crisis and, and exactly how does monetary policy or how can monetary policy help here? So it's a, it's a very uh, special situation where monetary policy is vitally important in a fundamentally different way to normal. Most of the time, and if you go back two or three months, uh, our kind of focus was... How, how do we provide the uh, monetary policy to help inflation uh, recover uh, to, towards our aim of, of close to, to 2%? So that's the normal uh, focus of monetary policy. It's about delivering price stability. Now, with this shock, when it came along, there were two big issues. One, when you have a dramatic downturn in the economy, that threatens price stability because, of course, uh, a very large reversal in the economy is also a situation where uh, disinflationary pressures are likely. So uh, we, we have to respond uh, to that. Uh, a second issue, of course, is uh, in a situation where there's uh, a lot of uh, lost uh, revenue. Many firms have lost revenue for a few weeks or months. There's a big demand for liquidity. Uh, because, of course, uh, a firm that was in good shape, at the very least, may need to borrow for a few weeks to maintain uh, cash flow. So liquidity needs uh, went up a lot. And third, uh, this is a, a really large shock in financial markets. So uh, if you like, the normal uh, activities of, of debt markets in particular are interrupted when, when you, you have to revise uh, your beliefs about the world in such a big way. So the ECB, uh, if you like, on those three fronts, 
Uh, one is uh, in terms of the uh, funding conditions in the economy, the, the path of interest rates. Two is in terms of uh, liquidity. And three is in terms of market stabilization. So whether it's the ECB or the other major central banks, uh, we've been extremely busy uh, to address those issues, essentially through uh, very large liquidity operations with our flagship uh, targeted lending program, through uh, uh, stepping up of our asset purchases, especially through the new uh, pandemic emergency purchase program, the PEP, and also, which really serves two functions. One is to stabilize uh, the, the securities markets. So whether that's commercial paper, corporate debt, uh, sovereign debt, there's a stabilization role. But also in a world where the interest rate is already very low, it's our main way to keep uh, the path of interest rates, short-term rates, medium-term rates, long-term rates, low enough to provide the, the conditions under which uh, households and firms uh, can obtain funding at a reasonable rate. So that's the playbook. And let me emphasize, this is all in the context of a remarkable uh, role for fiscal policy. The lessons from uh, previous uh, uh, large shocks, the Great Depression and so on, is that it's very important that uh, the shock is not compounded by, for example, a loss of household income. So what we've seen is uh, is governments around the world stepping in with large transfer programs whether that's uh, unemployment payments or payments to firms to help meet their payroll costs. And so this is really uh, has been a very dramatic uh, period for, for uh, fiscal policy and for monetary policy. OK, and the two things are crucial to go together because the, the monetary policy is not going well, to... I mean... Yes, go, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, so the, the idea that they go together, it's... It's very important to to make this point, especially when you know uh, we often talk about central bank independence. Is this large shock is independently uh, calling for a very uh, responsive monetary policy and a very responsive fiscal policy? So it's essentially the situation uh, does call for a lot of policy action on both fronts. Essentially, the, almost the definition of liquidity, it bridges a gap. But the ultimate uh, you know, hit on firms, on households, has to be met by fiscal policy. But central banks on their own can only do so much. So th- there's an absolutely central role for fiscal policy. What's also true is, is the effectiveness of, f- of fiscal policy would be uh, less if the uh, liquidity provision and the interest rate policy of central banks did not respond to, to this shock. Okay, and if we just go a little bit deeper into those two big responses by the ECB, so we've got the um, the, the, the pandemic emergency purchase program, which is asset purchases or uh, a, a, a form of QE um, that we've we've added, and then on the other hand, we've got the the, the targeted uh, lending operations. The, targeted longer term refinancing operations or teltros uh, in the jargon. So if we just look at the first one, the, the pandemic emergency purchase program, the PEP, um, that, that's of the three things that you mentioned that if, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, that's to target two of those contingencies. It's basically one big part is this idea of calming um, financial markets, but the other big one is dealing with this disinflationary uh, hit that's caused by the, the sudden stop to economic activity. Is that a good summary or are you probably going to correct me? Exactly. So uh, it plays that uh, double role. By the way, they, they go together. Uh, the, the kind of uh, market stabilization uh, problem would be more severe if interest rates were higher. Um, but equally, if the market stabilization uh, was not handled, then, then the impact on uh, risk premia, on uh, market frictions and so on would push interest rates up. So they, they go together. And this is why maybe it's not so easy for someone uh, trying to understand PEP to, to have an exact, if you like, a numerical split between those two functions. And because they're intertwined, you know, it's important conceptually to make that distinction, even though, of course, 
the same asset purchases are playing by rules. Maybe it's worth having a, a quick word on inflation because you've said that this is a big disinflationary um, shock from um, the pandemic. I was watching um, the local German TV last night. They had a very nice report about how um, vegetable prices and fruit prices had gone up in, in the supermarket um, because, for example, lemons grown in Spain you now see the, the the people picking the lemons have to be socially distanced. They have to come on a big bus, which costs more for the, the farmer to provide. And then the transport of the lorry driving from Spain to Germany costs more because on the way back to Spain, it doesn't have anything to put into it. So their message was, oh, look, prices are going up. But actually, I think what we're saying is we expect, on balance, uh, prices to go down. Right. So, I mean, I, it's absolutely correct. And um, the yeah. It's visible, I think, in a lot of countries, for example, that kind of uh, perishable food uh, item uh, is going up in price right now. So there's a, certainly a degree of circumstantial inflation that if you are uh, in a sector which has a very high demand, so supermarkets are quite busy. Uh, and at the same time, as you say, there are kind of uh, new cost components because of the social distancing and other dimensions. There will be particular types of prices that go up, but in the overall uh, scheme of the, of the whole European economy, many firms are facing a situation of uh, much lower demand they used to face. So as the economy recovers, as these firms try to drum up business, try to convince households which are maybe quite nervous about spending, then there's a lot of uh, going to be a lot of downward price pressure. So I think uh, you know the 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 it's hard. And um, if by the way, going back even to the Great Depression, uh, we know when we've had these really large slumps before that the dominant initial uh, dynamic is going to be disinflationary. I, I agree. There's a open quest about the medium term about maybe uh, whether there's also some forces in the opposite direction. But by the way, some of the forces in the opposite direction will be the outcome of failure. So if, for example, if we if there's a failure to maintain the productive capacity of the economy, if too many firms go out of business and they don't come back, if too many uh, workers become unemployed and get trapped in a, in a kind of uh, long-term unemployment problem, then uh, the productive capacity of an economy will decline in the medium term. And that, that on its own uh, is a, a force that would, uh, would not be good for the inflation outlook. So I think I wouldn't find any reassurance in, in scenarios where people would say, well, because of the uh, you know decline in economic potential, uh, inflation is going to be more likely. So, okay. uh, you know, but I think that it, for now, for the horizon of monetary policy of making sure the next number of months are we do what we can, I think the pressure is mostly disinflationary. Okay, so looking at the, the other thing that we're doing, these targeted uh, longer term refinancing operations or Teltros, um, that's about liquidity, which you already spoke about, but maybe we can go a bit further on that one. The, the idea there is basically to ensure that banks are still in a position that they can lend to firms and households. Right. So in, in a big downturn, the temptation for banks is, is to pull back is that uh, oftentimes uh, we, we, we are seeing that even though uh, firms and, and uh, households are looking to borrow to smooth out the impact of the downturn on their, on their expenditure, uh, banks are looking at a downturn and saying, well, maybe it's too risky uh, to make lending uh, decisions. So what uh, the targeted lending program does is it provides very generous funding to banks, but conditional on maintaining lending. So it it basically offsets the kind of uh, temptation to have a credit squeeze in, in a recession by providing the incentive to maintain lending. And, uh, you know, I think uh, this is now the, the third generation of targeted lending programs at the ECB. Uh, we've learned a lot. We understand that, that these uh, can work uh, quite, quite effectively. And all the indications are is that this new targeted program uh, will be quite effective in the coming weeks and months in ensuring that the downturn that we face 
is not made worse by by a credit squeeze. You've mentioned several times already the the, the Great Depression um, and some of the historical um, comparisons that are being drawn. So maybe we'll let's finish with a perhaps unfairly impossible question, but you can give us some indication of where your thinking is, which is the, the long term effects of this crisis on our economy. Um, do, what what are your sort of initial thoughts on that? Where where does this lead to? Of course, uh, I mean, you know, I'm sure we're all reading the same uh, stories for individual sectors. It's possible to to imagine uh, long term effects, uh, the future of the office, uh, the future of travel, and so on. But from a, a lot of that is going to be a reallocation, uh, if you like. Uh, some sectors will uh, see increased demand; other sectors may see uh, reduced demand. So, for the ECB, uh, our major focus is on the overall uh, macro effect, and there, I think, it remains the case that unlike the Great Depression, this should not last a very long time. There should be a significant recovery. And if you like the major damage to the long term, it would be, if you like, uh, if there were policy failures that made the the crisis worse than otherwise and led to longer term inactivity, uh, where the level of demand in the economy doesn't recover sufficiently to to allow uh, full employment to return. So I think uh, fiscal policy and monetary policymakers have a heavy responsibility. And outside of those policy areas, of course, the major factor is going to be uh, the public health challenge of getting this uh, virus under control. Okay. Philip, thank you very much. And, and thank you so much for uh, for joining us on, on the line over from, from Dublin. I hope the internet played along okay with both of us there. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. This brings us to the end of this episode. We've seen that in the current extreme situation brought about by the coronavirus pandemic, the ECB is determined to support people, firms and banks through the current crisis. Stay tuned for our next episode, in which we'll discuss how the coronavirus crisis has impacted financial markets and what our role is there as a central bank. As usual, we'll link to a few publications by the ECB in the show notes, as well as other related information, including our web pages that aim to explain the ECB's measures in plain language. We'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts for future episodes via social media. You can use direct messages and comments. You've been listening to the European Central Bank Podcast with Michael Steen. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.